first up on the agenda is House File 442, Representative Herr. Welcome back to the Tax Committee. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to move that House File 442 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Tax Bill. And I understand, Representative Herr, that there is an author's amendment. There is, <clears throat> Madam Chair, there is an author's amendment. And this, it actually, if we could adopt the amendment, it does put the bill in the order uh, for us to have a discussion of today. It does increase the overall um, impact, the, the threshold. So uh, for um, a married couple, it's a million dollars for joint, those filing jointly, and a 600,000 for single taxpayers, and 800 for the head of household taxpayers. And then, uh, so that's, those are some of the adjustments in the amendment, but it puts the bill in the order that uh, we need to, for the discussion today. Excellent, thank you So for explaining that. Um, so I will move the A1 amendment. Is there any discussion on the Ooh. amendment? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. The, a, uh, the motion prevails and the A1 amendment is adopted and the bill is in the form that the author would like. Uh, Representative Herr to House File 442 as amended. Thank you, Chair Gomez and committee for hearing House File 442. Um, I think that maybe the, what I'll do is just address maybe uh, quickly about why this bill is still important at this time. And I do have testifiers here today who will speak to the bill. But um, I know that you know, on weighing on many people's mind is that we are, uh, have a record surplus um, and that the, where, why is there a need to raise taxes? And I just want to be very clear that you know, what we have in our surplus is one-time money. And we do know that as a state that we care about people and we care about ensuring that they have the resources that they need in order to live uh, full lives. And in order to do that, we need dedicated revenues. Uh, just as an example, in uh, pensions, which I chair, we needed $3 billion in order to actually address the needs of the individuals. Um, we have pensions to ensure that they are whole or they are fully funded or to ensure that changes that we need to make uh, to ensure that people have the cost of living adjustments needed. I would have needed over $3.3 billion. And what I got was a record uh, target, which was $600 million, and we did the best that we could with that. And that we're also seeing the same thing that in AG, as I talked to Chair Vang, we talked about how there are programs for farm to table that needs ongoing funding, which we do not have and we can't do with one-time money. And so when we're talking about from our farmers to our families in the city that in order for us to provide the resources they need to have good quality of life, we do need to have uh, increased dedicated revenue sources and that is why this bill is really important at this time. So with that, uh, I know that there will be a lot of questions specifically about the bill and what it does, but I do just want to remind the committee that this bill really looks at income levels, the taxable income, as uh, I stated earlier, jointly for a million dollars and if you're single taxpayer, that's 600000 and then for 800000 for heads of household taxpayers. Um, and I'll just uh, be really upfront with this committee that last year I was able to pull the actual number of people impacted, but because uh, we were on break and I did not want to ask staff to uh, do extra work for me during that time period, uh, the numbers that I'll be able to share with you may be based on a little bit older data, but it is all nonetheless is actually even more favorable because we increased that taxable amount from 500000 to a million. And so with that, Chair, uh, I would uh, turn it over to my testifiers to, uh, test, uh, for their testimony. Thank you very much, Chair Her. Um, so we have a number of testifiers. Uh, is Liotta Goodney here? Maybe not, we heard. Okay. She comes in, we'll hear from her. Um, Beth Kadoon, welcome back to the committee. Go ahead. Thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Beth Kadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and we strongly oppose this bill as this will make Minnesota a tax outlier and negatively impact our state's businesses and our economic growth. At 10.85%, Minnesota would have the fourth highest rate in the nation, just below New York, Hawaii, and California. I would note that actually Minnesota imposes higher taxes than some of those other states. <coughs> California doesn't have an estate tax. Um, Hawaii and New York actually have a higher threshold before their estate tax kicks in. And they all have lower corporate tax rates. New York and California also have the most domestic net out migration than any other states. So not necessarily states that we want to model after. This tax will greatly impact many businesses as most are passed through entities paying their business taxes through the individual income tax. This high tax will mean less revenue available to reinvest back in their employees and companies. Its profit is what allows them to hire more workers, invest in new equipment, and grow their businesses. This high tax will also negatively impact talent attraction 
and create an even larger financial disincentive for upper income taxpayers to remain in our state. Minnesota is moving in the opposite direction of 22 other states that have lowered their tax rates since um, 2021. There was a handout um, in your packet that should show you a map of those states, plus list the nine other states that do not actually have an income tax at all. At 10.85%, Minnesota would be over twice as high as the median state's top individual income tax rate that is now 5%. The reliance on a smaller mobile segment of our state's population and on more volatile taxes puts the stability of our state's budget at risk. Good tax policy recommends a system with a broad base and low rates in order to minimize economic impact and for greater fiscal stability for our budget. The trend we are seeing for Minnesota is not positive. As Minnesota is lagging in national growth, it has lost population to other states in all but two years since 2001. But unfortunately, the pace is quickening. From 2010 to 2019, the average annual net out migration was a loss of 2,378 people. <coughs> Last year, Minnesota ranked 42nd in the nation with a loss of 19,400 people. This new high tax rate would unfortunately create an even greater incentive to relocate from Minnesota. With the increased ability to work remotely and the tax gap widening between Minnesota and neighboring interior states, in an ever increasingly competitive business climate, Minnesota should be looking at lowering our income tax rates, not raising them, and we urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kelly Martinson, and Gavin Hansen is on deck. Good afternoon, Chair Gomez and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Martinson and I work with Kids Count on Us. I have the honor of telling the stories of the hundreds of child care providers, teachers, and parents struggling to provide child care, struggling to afford and find child care, and struggling to make a living working in child care. I'm here today to speak on behalf of those providers, parents, teachers, and Minnesota's kids in support of HF 442, which modifies income tax rates and brackets, notably including a fifth tier tax bracket for those who earn substantially more than the average Minnesotan. Child care in Minnesota is balancing on a very thin thread and in many areas of the state, that thread has already broken. The issue is quite simple. Child care is expensive to provide, just like K-12 education is expensive to provide. For decades, we have kept the price of child care more affordable for parents by paying teachers, who are largely women and often women of color, poverty wages. Child care workers make an average of just $12 to $13 an hour. Some child care providers are literally working for free to keep their doors open for their communities. Others are actually pouring their own money into their centers to be able to care for our youngest Minnesotans. Child care providers are struggling to staff their centers because they cannot compete with the wages being offered by Target or Walmart. The only way they can pay their teachers more is to raise rates for parents who are already paying substantial amounts of their income for child care. Public funding is necessary to bridge the gap between what parents can afford and what teachers deserve to earn. This funding can make child care affordable so that no family pays more than 7% of their income for child care, ensure it is high quality for all Minnesota kids, and make it a career for teachers that they can afford to stay in. <coughs> we often hear there's not enough money to fund child care, but we know that Minnesota is a wealthy state with more than enough resources to care for all of us. <coughs> During the pandemic, wealthier Minnesotans did very, very well. They also do very well when we're not in a pandemic. As you said in this committee just a few weeks ago, Chair Gomez, the reason we have the unprecedented surplus we have is because of economic inequality, because the wealthiest Minnesotans have made even more money off the labor of those working in grocery stores, healthcare, and especially those working in our early childhood system. <coughs> Excuse me. The resources are there and this tax bill is more than fair. It sets the highest tax bra bracket rate at 10.85%, which is less than the percentage of the family income that most families pay for childcare. Many families pay much more than 10.85% of their income. Some pay as much as 50% of their income for childcare. And some simply stop working because they cannot afford childcare at all. We have the resources. This bill would raise billions each biennium, which could fully fund childcare. I urge you to support HF 442 so we can use those resources to fund our children's futures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gavin Hansen 
And then on deck is Martha Njolo Mole. And Madam Chair, we're taking questions at the end? Yes. The testimony? Okay, thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Gavin Hansen, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Business Partnership, which represents many of Minnesota's largest employers. Minnesota currently enjoys a historic surplus of roughly $17.6 billion. The state's rainy day fund is full. Simply stated, raising taxes is completely unnecessary. And for many, uh, many businesses and hardworking Minnesotans, it will be economically harmful. Currently, Minnesota's top individual tax rate is the sixth highest in the nation. If House File 442 becomes law, creating a fifth tier income tax, it would propel Minnesota to fourth highest income tax rate in the nation behind only New York, Hawaii, and California. This would seriously harm the state's competitiveness, discourage investment in the state, and further solidify Minnesota's reputation for having a hostile tax climate, all while the state is sitting on a historic $17.6 billion surplus. Of course, this is merely one of many of taxes increases being debated at the Capitol right now. Others include our payroll tax on the employers and employees of over $1.5 billion, 1% 1 sales tax increase in the seven county metro area, a 75 cent delivery tax on every taxable delivery, motor vehicle tax increases, and tab fee hikes. We urge you to consider the cumulative impact these policies will have on Minnesotans. Looking outside of Minnesota, policymakers in other states are reducing taxes. Last year, 11 states enacted personal income tax reductions. The year prior, another 13 states enacted reductions. Our neighbor, Iowa, reduced their taxable bracket from 9 to 4 and lowered their top tax rate from 8.53% to 6%. Our member companies and their employees, like many Minnesota businesses, are competing regionally and globally. Minnesota has among the highest tax rates in the nation for personal income, corporate income, business property, and sales taxes. A new fifth-tier income tax will only make Minnesota more of a tax outlier, which will inhibit our ability to recruit a skilled workforce and drive investment out of the state. Instead of increasing income taxes, we urge you to consider tax policies that help Minnesota businesses remain competitive. We look forward to continuing working with our members of this committee to attain those goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, up next is Martha Njolomole, and on deck is Ben Baglio. Welcome to the committee. Please just introduce yourself as you get started with your testimony, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Martin Jolomoli. I am an economist at Center of the American Experiment. Uh, like the previous text file, I'm here to speak in opposition to House File 442. Minnesota already has some of the highest income tax rates in the country, and we also have uh, a very progressive income tax system. If adopted, HA 442 will make us even less competitive and depress economic growth. Uh, just to comment on what one of the previous test files has said, uh, I do agree with a lot of people in this room that childcare uh, is very expensive for parents uh, in Minnesota. Childcare is actually ex more expensive here compared to a lot of states. But the truth is also that we do spend quite a lot of money uh, in this state compared to a lot of states. And all of that spending hasn't managed to alleviate a lot of our socioeconomic woes. So it's highly unlikely that if we spend some more, we are going to solve uh, the childcare crisis. And the big reason for that is because childcare is expensive because of our uh, strict regulations. Uh, Minnesota currently spends, according to uh, data from the, ta uh, from the US Census Bureau, in 2019, Minnesota had the fourth highest spending uh, in the country. So we, we are both a high spending and a high, uh, high, te uh, high tax aid. Uh, raising taxes is not something we have been doing uh, I would like to also say that a lot of research uh, generally shows that high tax rates don't necessarily lead to higher revenues. This is because tax rates, uh, tax revenues are usually um, an outcome of economic growth. So if you want to uh, have higher revenues, we would actually do better by uh, lowering our tax rates and uh, growing uh, Minnesota's uh, economy. I know the governor has uh, been worried for a uh, couple months now about attracting workers in the state. This is something that businesses are having an issue with. The truth is that we need people to come and work here, and we also need people to come and invest here. But in order to get those people, we need to make the state an income, uh, an attractive place for people to move to. But so far, that's something we've been losing. We lose a lot of people to low-tax states like Florida. 
uh, we lose especially high skilled and high uh, income workers. These are people that pay the majority of our income taxes. So if we do create a fifth year income tax tax uh, bracket, we're only going to uh, to make this trend even worse. We have a $17.5 billion surplus. This is a historic opportunity for us to lower taxes and create an attractive state for people to want to come to. This bill does just the opposite of that. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, next up is Ben Baglio. Good afternoon, Chair Gomez and members of the committee. My name is Ben Balio, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the Minnesota Nurses Association, whose more than 22,000 members make up four out of every five registered nurses working at the bedside in hospitals across our state. I'm here today to testify in support of House File 442, which would help ensure that Minnesota's top earners pay taxes in accordance with the wealth that our state has helped them accrue. MA is concerned about growing inequities and rising corporate profits at a time when so many are struggling to access health care, child care, housing, or education that they need <coughs> to live a healthy and sustainable life. Raising taxes on the incomes of the highest earners, the millionaires, would help create a more just and equitable state tax code, one that reflects the efforts that working families in Minnesota put in every day to keep our state running. MA's members put their physical and mental health on the line for our fellow Minnesotans at their most vulnerable moments. We want the state to do the same, to better prioritize the needs of people, and we can do that by establishing a state tax code that asks the most fortunate to pay their fair share, and in return, better support our state's collective health and well-being. MA believes that these revenue increases are essential to addressing Minnesota's pressing health care needs, including the ongoing mental health crisis, as well as other investments to support working families, like investments in child care, public education, workforce supports, and transportation. We hope that the legislature will take the opportunity before us today to ensure that a more equitable tax code, and we believe that this bill would help get us there. With that, I'd just like to thank the author of this bill, and also thank you, Chair Gomez, and members of the committee for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Balio. Uh, next up, Mark Haveman on deck, Eric Bernstein. She's here. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Mark Haveman. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence. Uh, in my testimony today, I'd like to share some information on the current degree of progressivity on our, takes on our state tax system, and also offer a comment pertaining to some uh, a body of recent tax policy research that I think is very relevant, uh, relevant to this bill. Uh, in your meeting materials, you have a handout from us with three charts. The first two are from our latest National Individual Income Tax Comparison Study, which is, to our knowledge, the nation's only effective tax rate study on state individual income taxation. The first table shows that Minnesota already has one of the most progressive in state income tax systems in the nation, as measured by the effective tax rate differential between taxpayers at different income levels. The second provides more color on state progressivity by showing our national rankings at different filer income levels. As you can see, we are near the bottom of the nation at the lowest income levels, rising to 36 to 46% above the national average at the highest income levels among states with an income tax. The third, day, the third table comes from the Department of Revenue's tax incident study and shows that the share of income tax collections for the highest earners have grown steadily over the past 20 years, yet the share of state household income represented by these earners have essentially been flat, if not declined, over that period. It's been well established that the United States has one of the most progressive tax systems in the world, yet at the same time features some of the highest degrees of income inequality and weakest transfer and social welfare programming. Scholars have asked why this is. They have found that progressive tax that, that they have found that progressive policies succeed within a larger political economy that is more favorable to business, among other things that includes the tax code. The most generous welfare and redistributive governments rely more heavily on regressive taxation, recognizing it as a way to generate revenues needed for social spending and investments without harming economic growth. The converse is also true. Countries with stronger progressive tax codes and more punitive business taxation have triggered stronger and more aggressive resistance to social welfare policies and related spending. These findings are from national tax policy investigations 
but arguably we would say these findings have as much or more relevance with respect to subnational taxation and its open borders. In conclusion, we have never been more reliant on individual income taxation and more reliant on the highest income earners in the process. From the standpoint of attracting capital and talent, ensuring balance and stability in the revenue system, and supporting the type of social welfare spending and investments on the agenda this year, Minnesota is in danger of playing the same policy card once too often. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Um, up next is Eric Bernstein. And on deck, I believe um, Liotta Goodney has joined us, and so we'll hear your testimony uh, next. Welcome to the committee. Hi, Chair Gomez, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Eric Bernstein, and I am the director of We Make Minnesota, which is a coalition of labor and community groups united in support of a sufficient and equitable state budget. Thank you for the opportunity to share our support for HF 442, which would create a new top marginal income tax bracket of 10.85% on incomes above $500,000 for single filers and $1 million for those filing jointly. Our coalition is happy to see revenue raisers up for discussion despite a surplus that grants the false impression that Minnesota state and local governments are adequately funded. The truth is that two thirds of the surplus is one time money and Minnesota has many unmet public investment needs. Minnesota's price of government has fallen substantially in recent decades. If we funded government at 1990s levels, we would have $13 billion more this biennium. Uh, our primary concern about this proposal is that it is somewhat poorly targeted. According to the updated revenue analysis included with today's materials, HF 442's millionaire bracket would affect only the top 0.8% of all Minnesota income taxpayers. This excludes many very high income Minnesotans that could easily afford to pay more to fund essential public goods and services. It also means that the proposed fifth tier would raise less revenue at a higher rate than would be possible with a lower threshold targeted, for example, at the top 10, 5, or 3%. Recent discussions in committee have suggested that there is bipartisan support for progressive revenue sources. This narrow high income tax increase limits the revenue raised and risks defining high income at a threshold that is more akin to super high income or super duper high income, if you will. Um, many of the objections to this bill will reference the relationship between tax rates and economic competitiveness. First, I think it's worth just saying that our you know, tax rates are marginal, which means that this would raise just $1 for every $100 earned over $1 million of taxable income. So you know, the individual response that we can expect, expect, I think, needs to be somewhat tempered by that reality. Um, on the broader question, I would just remind the committee that there are many studies um, between, uh, discussing the relationship between um, tax rates and economic growth with a wide range of results on this question. Uh, one frequent flaw in these estimations is that they examine the impact of taxes on uh, economic performance without considering the expenditures that these taxes enable. Once raised, tax dollars are not simply removed from the economy but are in fact spent directly back into our state where they finance valuable public goods and services, create jobs, and sustain communities. In fact, recent data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis showed that Minnesota has recorded the highest economic growth of any comparable state in the region for the past two quarters uh, on record, while South Dakota, our you know, famously low tax neighbor, has, uh, their economy has shrunk for the last three quarters in a row. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there can be a lot of speculation about tax rates and economic growth, but um, over the long term, Minnesota does have the fastest growing economy in the Midwest among comparable states of a comparable size and we've had higher tax rates uh, for much of that time. Um, finally, and most importantly, economic growth is just one very narrow metric by which to judge the health of our state. In addition to higher growth, Minnesota has also had lower poverty, higher wages, and longer life expe expectancy than most of our neighbors, this in part owing to our investments in healthcare, education, and many other important public goods. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Liotta Goodney. Welcome to the committee. Please just introduce yourself as you're going ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Gomez and members of the committee. I'm Leota Goodney, age 72 years old, a retired CPA and a leader with Isaiah. I continue to work part-time with a few elders who need help with their finances and managing their lives. I'm glad to learn that you are considering another tax bracket with a higher tax rate for high income people in Minnesota. As you know, there are three large components of the overall taxes paid by Minnesotans. The property tax, the sales tax, including the gas tax, and the income tax are the major components. It is really important that we have an overall tax structure in Minnesota that is progressive, 
so that those who have benefited the most from living, working, and owning businesses in Minnesota pay the most. According to the 2021 tax incidence study, which a previous uh, testifier referred to uh, and is done by the Minnesota Department of Revenue, our current overall structure, including all sources of taxes, is relatively flat. It ranges from 11.1 to approximately 12 percent. In fact, the top 1 percent of individuals, uh, those households making over 600K, pay an overall rate of 11.5 percent. That is lower than everyone else except people making between 30 and 40 thousand dollars a year. This proposed tax bracket would make our overall tax system more progressive by increasing the income tax for those who are most able to pay. We desperately need the additional tax dollars from a steady stream of um, uh, taxes going forward. Paid family and medical leave, affordable child care, and education funding will substantially improve life for my daughter and my grandchild. A living wage for personal care workers of all sorts will benefit my clients because there will be more people who can afford to do that work. And for myself, I'm looking forward to being able to use the Minnesota Care Public Option to purchase affordable health insurance for my brother-in-law who is not yet eligible for Medicare. I urge you to consider, all, uh, consider the overall rate structure in Minnesota and make it more equitable by adding the additional bracket so that we can fully fund the things that people need, no matter their address, their social group, or their income, and continue to have a stable budget into the future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So that concludes um, the, those people that I had signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on this bill who's here? All right, um, not seeing any, we will then go to uh, member discussion. First up, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Microphone's still not working. <laughs> we can hear you, Representative Good. Kosnick. Good. Um, just the, first off, a, a general question. Is there a section in this uh, A1 amendment that talks about child care? Because I didn't see it in here. I'm going to just uh, rely on your uh, ability to read the bill. And if you would like to make a statement, go okay. ahead and make a statement, please. Um, and then uh, to the author, the question is, is there, you know, this is, I, I believe, a one with after the A1 amendment, it's a million dollar tax increase, revenue raising, roughly. Representative Herr. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Uh, Representative Kosnick, yes. It's that joint filing jointly that's uh, taxable at a million dollars. Representative Kosnick. OK, thank you. I just wanted to double check that. But is that $1 million that's being raised, taxes being raised in this bill, is it tied to a specific expenditure like child care? Uh, just to clarify, Representative Kosnick, we do have a uh, revenue estimate. Um, it raises way more than a $1 million. But um, I'll just go to uh, Representative Her to answer the question about dedicated revenue. But again, we, you can read the bill. I think you see that there is not, there's no dedication of the revenue in this, uh, in this bill. Representative Her. Chair Gomez, Representative Kosnick, Representative Kosnick, I would love to be able to tie this to specific revenues that I would love to see it go to. But the truth is, is that we don't do that for the taxes that we raise. Just like within cities when they raise property taxes, they don't tell you what your property taxes, how that is going towards. And so this actually gives us more leeway in deciding where there's the greatest need where those taxes will be applied to. But given if it had all, all uh, a power and authority, I would love to be able to put it to specific, because it would go to the things I think are important. But I didn't do that, so thank you. <laughs> Representative okay. Kosnick. Well, thanks for clarifying that, and I, I, that's the way I understood it, that it is not tied to a specific expenditure, and some of the testifiers may be um, a little disappointed that it's not, uh, given their testimony. Um, but I will say that, you know, it's not a bad bill, except for about three lines in there, 1.13, 2.1, and 2.9. Um, otherwise, I kind of like uh, expanding the, uh, the income eligibility limits in the lower tax brackets and I you know this bill obviously uh, from my perspective and the perspective of uh, constituents that I represent uh, just have a very difficult time understanding why with such a huge surplus one time or not uh, with tax revenues overall coming to the state increasing uh, that number one they haven't seen a tax refund or rebate to them uh, but to the contrary we're sitting here in the tax committee uh, in this historic time and being asked, Minnesotans are being asked to pay more taxes, just unbelievable to me. 
So uh, if you could get rid of those three lines in there uh, that I mentioned, uh, you might get my support. Otherwise, uh, I think we're moving in the wrong direction. Representative Joy. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, when I look at this and I see tax revenue again, and I was up in district all over the Easter break here, and I'm right next to North Dakota. And North Dakota is looking at 0% to 1.5% personal income tax. And here's Minnesota over here. We're going to add another another fifth tier because we need to do this. I mean, when you live literally 15 minutes from the border, I mean, people are going to move. And, you know, to be a business owner and come back over here and say, you know what, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and build in Minnesota because it's good? No. I'm going to go to North Dakota because here's the thing. When we do this and we raise income tax on the wealthy, as we want to call it, and we continue to do this, and like for anybody that owns a business, we're going to pass that on to the business. And it's going to hurt the lower income people that come in and shop at our stores. It's going to affect them. So when we do this, we pass it on. I don't absorb it. I pass it on. Anybody pass. This is, we need to change the way we're looking at taxes and how we got to fix this because the bordering states, you know, Minnesota might show that they got more millionaires and more this, that. Okay, North Dakota and South Dakota don't have a professional football team. We do. You know, so we bring business here because of that. But I think this is ridiculous that we're continuing to tax people. And, you know, Kevin O'Leary says it, and he's made comments about Minnesota and stuff like that, and we're hearing it from North Dakota, and that's why he's over there investing money and creating business. So, Thank you. Uh, Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I just uh, thank you, Representative Her, for bringing this bill forward. And I know, just to put it in context, I think the average income and household income in my district is about fifty-five thousand dollars. And I know, um, a, to Representative Kosnick's point, that we don't dedicate revenue, but as the Ways and Means Chair, um, you see the global picture of what it's like in Minnesota, and you think about what we do with our budget. And I know. My colleagues across the aisle have talked about um, full exemption on Social Security, have talked about rebate checks, have talked about a number of things. Um, but you can't have that conversation in a vacuum of talking about raising revenue. And we think about the idea of um, how we raise revenue, and I think this is exactly the kind of bill we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at um, how we raise revenue in a way that really thinks about the future of our state and investing in the things we care about and making sure that we're raising revenue in a way that this bill, for folks making over a million dollars a year, um, a, a small increase, as we heard from the testifiers today, and I think this is exactly what we need to bring to the table in order to be able to even have the conversation about the other things we're talking about. Because with a one-time surplus, I know we brush that away, and it seems easy for us to say, well, we have a surplus, but it's one time, but we should be able to figure out. You can't. You can't budget into the future. I look across the table and I see the chair of education and early childhood and housing. You cannot budget long-term to solve our problems on a one-time surplus. And we have to have the conversation about raising revenue in this tax committee in order to have the conversation about funding our nursing homes things that we've brought up on the House floor that we've tried to suspend the rules on. Like you cannot have a conversation about something, funding something in perpetuity if you don't also have a conversation about how you are going to pay for it into the future because that is dishonest and not a way that we can think about budgeting here in the state of Minnesota. And so I am really glad that we are having this bill heard today and being considered as we think about all the other things we need to do today, today and into the future. Thank you. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Herr. I um, obviously do not support this bill. I feel like I'm a broken record talking about our competitiveness all the time, members. But um, one of the testifiers mentioned that this would uh, probably put us into the fourth highest in personal income. By my estimate, it's actually we would be number three in the country for highest income tax. And members, this not only affects like uber wealthy people who make a lot of dividend income. A lot of our businesses in Minnesota pay their taxes through personal pass through taxes. Businesses are the drivers of economic growth. To Representative Olson's point, we need long term budget strategies. And one of those ways we do it is creating economic growth. And we are hurting ourselves, members. All the tax increases in the world aren't going to create the revenue we need in this state. We need to expand 
the economy. We need to have investment. We need to attract talent. And this bill will do the opposite. If we are number three for personal income taxes, in Minnesota, we already treat capital gains as the same as um, personal income. So if, a, if someone sells their business, if someone sells their home, if someone sells their farm, they are now going to be taxed at the third highest rate in the country. And so many businesses pay through um, pass through income and they will be hurt by this. And that then gets passed on to the customer as Representative Joy talked about. So this is going to hurt the families in our districts who are going to have even higher inflation in the grocery store, in the local cafe, in wherever, because businesses have to pass this on. So members, we need to look at policies that will drive economic growth, and that is how we will raise revenue for our state. So I, I really encourage the committee to take a pass on this, and let's look at reducing taxes in ways that will drive economic growth. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Hur. Chair Gomez, um, can I just provide some perspective on the scope of this, just because I hear yes, a lot of conversations from everyone. I just want to be very clear that the impact of this is going to be on 0.8% uh, of all returns. That's 24,200. In perspective, that's, we have 5.7 million people in the state of Minnesota. That's a 0.4% impact on our population. And because we're only, this is only impacting the dollar after the million dollar, again, taxable, not your gross income, your taxable income. That's after you take out all of the things that you get to deduct ahead of time. And that's going to have an average of $9,231 impact on those individuals. So I know we're talking about this as if it is extremely detrimental, but I want us to remember the scope of what this impacts. And I want to reiterate that our state is actually, and anybody who's been listening to the state demographer is telling you our population is growing. It has been growing. The city of St. Paul is over 300,000 now residents. It's the highest it's been in 30 years. And so we keep talking about we're losing residents, but I want to be very clear here that we are actually gaining residents and our growth is faster than those uh, with lower tax states like North Dakota and Iowa. So yes, we do see changes between people moving between states, but net Minnesota is up. And so I know we are very concerned, but I want us to remember the scope of what we are looking at and the impact that we are looking at. And I know that we are continuing to have conversations about the surplus, but in and, and the lack of understanding of that Minnesotans don't understand, I think Minnesotans are really smart. They do understand. Uh, Representative Kosnick's comment on they don't understand uh, why we have this surplus. Because we've all put budgets together for ourselves. And we never make structural changes without knowing where that money is coming from. I'm not going to buy a new car if I got a $1,000 bonus check. I'm not going to go out and buy a new car because that's a bonus check. And so when we understand how finances work, Minnesotans are very smart. They understand one-time surplus does not allow us to make uh, structural changes in how we spend our money here. And so I just want to remember to kind of focus us in on what this bill is actually doing and the impact that this bill has. Thank you, Representative Herr. Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to thank the testifiers uh, who raised the point about how um, the revenue that gets raised is linked to um, the investments that our state makes. Because to my mind, that's completely within the scope of the work that we're doing. And actually, I guess it makes me think about so often in spending committees, I feel like I hear from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle saying that the spending that is being proposed to invest in people in different areas in education and housing um, is not sustainable. They make references to taxation that's often brought up. Um, and I think it is appropriate for us to be thinking from a big picture perspective. And the big picture is that um, our state um, has taken a different path than the other states around us and has done really well because of it. There is a reason that we have all those professional sports teams. Um, that was not true multiple decades ago. Our state got on a different path in the 1950s and is a state that has been richer um, both materially and also in terms of health and wellness than those states around us. Um, we've gained 5,000 residents from North Dakota in the last couple of years. We've gained 2,000 res residents from Iowa in the last couple of years. Um, when people are deciding where they want to locate their businesses and themselves, they want to locate them in places um, that have a rich quality of life and a place that will, in fact, make them rich, which Minnesota does because we have a really strong economy and have for years because of how it's built. Um, 
Our state is built on the idea that when we invest in people, that is how we expand the economic base. That is how we make ourselves competitive. Um, and I would argue that uh, certainly an area that I've focused a lot on, that's true in those early years. We know there's no bigger payoff than having high quality early childhood education. That's a huge need. We know that that's true in K-12 education. It's true when people are stably housed. It's true in a variety of areas. And it is well within the scope to recognize that revenue being linked to that um, is absolutely a key. And so Representative Hur, thank you so much for your leadership in pushing this. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name was mentioned a couple times, otherwise I generally wouldn't speak more than once. Um, you know, one of the testifiers had talked about advocating for a sufficient and equitable state budget. The problem is with raising, continuing to raise taxes with increasing revenues already is that the amount of spending we're doing is not sustainable. The revenues are there. We don't have a revenue problem. We continue to add more and more spending and more programs ongoing with sometimes one-time funding. And that's what the problem is, and that's what taxpayers have a hard time understanding. They keep paying more taxes, higher taxes. They're being asked to pay more taxes in a variety of ways outside of even the, just this bill. And this, uh, I'm talking more in general, not just if you happen to uh, be blessed and make over uh, a certain threshold that's in this bill. Uh, all taxpayers are being asked to pay more and more, uh, whether uh, you know we could go through the whole litany of the tax revenue raisers that the DFL is proposing this, this session, and that's what's hard to understand. The state is not short on money right now, but yet we're being asked to pay more here, pay more there, and in this bill um, just happens to epitomize uh, what's being proposed by the DFL. So we don't have a revenue problem. It is absolutely a spending problem and proposing new and ongoing spending with one-time money, uh, one-time surplus with long-term expenditures. So um, that's what Minnesotans have a hard time understanding. Representative Weiner. Are they working or not? Mine seems to work. I don't okay. know. Yeah. Just, just yell like I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, just please yell at us. <laughs> Representative Winger. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's some basic numbers, and there's been a lot of them thrown around today. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 5.3% increase in, in uh, wages in Minnesota. We also have about 9, about 9, almost 10% inflation, which means that people's wages are actually going backwards. We've also seen, and, and to uh, Representative Kosnick's point, about a 35% in increase in spending. So once again, this is not a tax issue, this is a spending issue. We can't keep spending our way out of a problem. We've also seen in this committee and the other committees tax credits to pull businesses in. In order to build our economy, pull, the, pull industry in, we need to offer them tax credits. It was a selling point for many of these projects. And yet here we are saying we're going to raise taxes. So if, if we take that those millionaires in that top tax bracket, and they are the most, can afford the most to leave the state, who picks up the tab when they're gone? <clears throat> once the spending is there, once the spending's in place and government increases even more, and the millionaires and the businesses to decide to leave, because we've seen businesses leave. Corporations have left the state because they can go to other areas, other countries where their taxes are lower. Who picks up the tab? That's what my concern is with this bill and with spending and government growth as a whole. We end up hurting the people that they can at least afford to pay these bills. So my question, I guess, is, Going back to the, the top tier, we've seen an increase in, in, in projected spending, but how do you, how do you um, substitute when they leave? Where is that tax money going to come from if the spending is in place? Representative Herb. Chair Gomez, Representative Weiner, I think that we already answered that question. We are having more people coming into our state than leaving. So there's people coming in. And um, I, I just want to uh, address the... We have a spending problem and not a revenue problem. Well, I'd like for you all to tell officers who I only had $100 million to pay in this biennium for their duty disability. I don't have ongoing money for that. 
in their pension bill. And these are officers who serve our state and are out on duty disability and their plan is going bankrupt because we can't make fundamental changes to their pension plan because we don't have the money to pay for that going forward. So then tell me who, who how, so that's a spending problem. I thought we need to pay for that somehow. Tell teachers who are now asking for pensions. You all probably got all the emails. I did thousands of emails about teachers and their pensions. Are we have a spending problem. We clearly need to make some fundamental changes about revenues we're bringing in. It's not an issue of spending. We don't have the money to actually address all the issues that we are experiencing right now. So if you can all tell me how I'm gonna tell officers that I only have one biennium of money to pay for the duty disability because we won't raise taxes on the wealthiest people who is only gonna be 24,000 people impacted. I don't know how we tell them that we have a spending problem when they're feeling like we're not spending enough. So I don't know, I guess I, I think the answer is, the question's already been answered that people are moving in, so we don't have to worry about that. The other problem is that this is not a spending problem, this is a revenue problem, and we have to balance both. We can't keep talking about taking care of people who serve our state and then say, but we won't raise the revenues to actually take care of them. Like uh, Representative Olson said, you can't have a conversation with, of, of spending and giving money back without saying how are we gonna raise the revenue to sustain that. Thank you. Uh, you good? Well, not really. <laughs> Representative Weiner. So in a conversation just recently with an economist, the question came up, at what point do taxes drive people and businesses out of a state? And the obvious answer was look at California. We are heading in the same direction as they are. When you talked about the population, according to what I've seen, we've lost about 20,000 people. So ha have we increased in some areas? Sure we have. But overall, we've lost people. And we saw a decrease of businesses, primarily small businesses, I think about three to 5,000 in the last two years. Some of that's COVID, but some of it's businesses moving to a more equitable tax state. So when we talk about spending, this seems to be a disconnect between government spending, our budgets, which have come up many times. It's not our budgets, it's taxpayers' money. And when they're suffering out there, because we've heard this a time and time again, that we need to do something for these people right now, maybe we need to stop taking money from them in the first place. Uh, Representative Swidzinski. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a, a question to, to maybe fiscal staff real quick. Um, so in, in my uh, sheet, I've got that in 2024 and 2025, it'll bring in about two, 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 two billion dollars and then about roughly the same in 26, 27. Um, is that simply the, uh, total amount um, of that this oh the, um, the okay sorry the amendment is 500 okay 500 million that's not is that just the increase from the increase uh, of their current uh, what percent uh, of the state budget would be paid for by this 0 0.08 or these 24,000 filers it's not just 500 it's just 500 million additional um, as far as a percentage from our state uh, coffers. Do we have some of those numbers on a tier? Like what, what is the total that this tier, new tier would pay in, in taxable revenue to the state? Um, so Representative Swazinski, I, I assume that those percentages aren't available at this moment and I'm sure that Ms. Templin can follow up. But, but if you look at, um, actually at this uh, piece from that Haveman, uh, put, that uh, Mr. Haveman put in the, um, in our packet, there's sort of a little uh, table from the incident study at the bottom that might get at some of your questions. Um, Ms. Templin, did you have anything additional to add at this time, or, or is this sort of a follow-up? Um, Madam Chair, Representative Swidzinski, yes, what you see is the estimated revenue gain um, of the 10.8 eight five percent um, proposed fifth tier at roughly uh, 280.9 million and about 250 million in fiscal 25. The February forecast has uh, under current law individual income tax uh, revenue collections. Uh, the total uh, for the uh, fiscal 24-25 biennium is about 32.66 uh, uh, billion and um, and so this additional revenue um, that is projected with the fifth tier would be on top of that 32.66 billion thank you okay thank you thank you very much representative Swisinski thank you miss Templin um, and just you know just a general uh, you know comment you know if if this was the only thing coming at 
our job creators. You know, I think maybe, you know, it maybe wasn't as, as, as big of a deal, but, you know, we've got a lot of other things. We've got, we've got the environmental bill that's going to be coming after business owners and, and, and entrepreneurs uh, that's going to put a lot more auspice, a lot more cost to this face is doing business. Paid family leave taxes that, you know, are going to just kind of come out of the middle of nowhere, you know, multiple billions of dollars, um, you know, and, and the, the fine representative who's carrying this bill said, well, this isn't a spending problem. Well, folks, it is a spending problem. You know, I, I like to build word pictures for people, and I think, you know, one of the, the things I want you to imagine, uh, this is about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, you were at the, uh, the movie theater with uh, that special friend of yours, and it was the movie Titanic. And there's that one scene where the ship's going and the people are out, the lifeboats have already been kind of released, and, and uh, people are, are kind of looking back at the ship and, and seeing the glistening lights. And you could look through the windows and you could see people running back and forth in the windows. And then they cut to the base of the, the ship. And inside the ship, the lights are still on. And there's these workers that are in the electrical room. And they're running back and forth as the, 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 the fuse, the trip, the trip trips down and the lights shut off in that part of the ship. And that worker is running back and forth and trying to keep the lights on. And all of a sudden, da, 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 he gets electrocuted. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, our, our state government, you look at what's going internationally with our currency, you look at what's going on at the federal government level, you know, massive amounts of, 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 of borrowing, massive amounts of a potential tax increase. Hey, we're just going to keep that, you know, that it's kind of like that worker, you know, all of us here, in, in the majority, the minority in the state government, we're just going to keep those lights on, run back and forth and rack and forth. And, and, and this tax increase is it's kind of like that worker running back and forth. Hey, we want to just keep the lights on for a little bit longer um, as the ship's going down. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, we've heard a lot back, you know, the conversations happen about peak oil and, and peak th this and that. You know, we're in an era of peak big government. And government has gotten about as big as it possibly can. We've borrowed billions, we've borrowed trillions, we've borrowed this, we've borrowed that, we've mortgaged our children's future. Let's not mortgage their opportunity to live here in Minnesota as well. And by doing that, by raising taxes on, on, on across the board, whether it's a paid family leave tax, whether it's this tax, uh, whether it's increasing $10 million in the in energy bill of ratepayers so that we can uh, have more, more government programs. And folks, it doesn't work. You know, I think Margaret Thatcher said it best. She said, the problem with socialism is that sooner or later you run out of other people's money. And folks, well, we're just dipping back into that pool again and saying, you know what, even though government's got a $19.5 billion surplus, even though we're already going to potentially raise taxes by multiple billions of dollars to grow government, to grow really dependence on government, it's not enough. We need to do more. You know, let's find efficient ways to do government. Let's actually learn to... Uh, focus our efforts on how do you grow an economy, grow jobs, have an environment where, you know, I, I believe for the, since 2015, Minnesota has seen a net, a net uh, people leaving, a net amount of people leaving our state. Mm -hmm. And who's coming and who's going? You know, what, I'd like to see what the income levels of who's coming and who's going. Because, you know, where I come from, you know, when, when, uh, when we want to get after cigarettes, in our state, what do we do? Well, we want to raise taxes on cigarettes so that people won't <coughs> smoke them. And what does that do? Well, it drives the purchase of those uh, cigarettes outside of the state boundaries. And then we worry about, hey, let's grow government. Let's hire six or eight people in enforcement so that we can clamp down on those folks that are driving across state lines and bringing cigarettes back. Well, if raising taxes fundamentally keeps people from smoking cigarettes, well, then raising taxes fundamentally keeps people from wanting to do business in the state of Minnesota. If raising taxes on cigarettes keeps people from smoking, then raising taxes on business owners and people that we care about, we want to we want to encourage people to grow their business here. We want to encourage retirees to live here to a ripe old age. <coughs> we we don't want to penalize people for dying in the state of Minnesota. And that's potentially what this is going to do. This is going to penalize people to die in Minnesota. And, you know, there is wisdom in age, not disdain. And I would encourage folks to, to not include this in any bills that move forward. Um, 
you've made some good decisions, Madam Chair, and I, would, I, I think it would be wise to maybe just kind of let this one just pass on down the line. So thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Lee. I was probably too young to watch Titanic when it came out, but do you want to say anything? <laughs> that um, since then, you know, I, I noticed it was the first class people who got all the lifeboats and they weren't full and they were the ones that survived. And so I, I do want to know that, um, you know, we've done really well in the last couple of years weathering the pandemic because we had really good leadership. Um, we had some of the lowest unemployment rates of states across the country. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I just want to say, um, what's really important is, is to really focus on the impact of with this policy, right? Um, Rep. Her has pointed out um, that we have a, a, a targeted uh, number of people who this will impact, and so I want to make sure folks understand this is not the doomsday like tax everybody bill that you know folks would want you to think. And I also want to make sure we also remember like the impact of this, right? We have to talk about investment in, in child care, in um, our public goods, in nursing homes, because that's what happens, um, you know, when you have good government and. And good policy, and so I just want to commend um, Chair Her for for this because again, like uh, Chair Olson has said, you know, we need to think about um, the other side of things and making sure that uh, we pay for the things we care about and pay for public goods. And again, maybe if, if you excessively use a public good, you should probably also pay for it. And so uh, I will offer that and turn it back to the chair. All right. Not only uh, Representative Sudzinski can uh, create word pictures for all of us, so we appreciate that. Um, uh, Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was also going to go with the Titanic metaphor, but I'll skip that part <laughs> of my uh, my talk. <clears throat> um, just, uh, I mean, this is somewhat of an interesting conversation because we could basically copy and paste everything that has been said against this bill, against the fourth tier um, that we talked about. Well, I wasn't here, but was talked about a decade ago. And so we know what happens when we add this, and it's good stuff. Uh, we, we get uh, more uh, money that we can use responsibly to help public services. Um, and since, uh, I mean, uh, nonpartisan staff can correct me if I'm wrong, I think uh, by 2019 we've seen 20,000 plus uh, filers go into that highest tier. We've added to that highest tier. So people aren't, aren't just like fleeing our state. We know that's, you know, that's not happening. Um, we can't just cry wolf every time that there's some sort of increase um, in our tax system. And I, I want to go even further and say taxes uh, are not in it of themselves evil. <laughs> um, they are ideally an expression of our society, what we think is good, how we want to live, how we want to relate to each other. Uh, we take a part of all of our incomes and we fund a society that we think is best. It's a wonderful tool that we have as people who live together in a state. And it crosses, crosses a whole bunch of lines from education to bank regulation to literacy to uh, the Secretary of State's office making sure businesses are actually businesses to uh, financial institutions making sure that they're responsible. I mean, Social Security, which we've talked about a lot. These are things that we have tax, we have because we have taxes. That we can't just talk about them in the evil sense of the word. And I actually would agree that things like vice taxes are not the great way because of the same reason. Um, we, taxes are what we do uh, to fund the things that are important to us. And I think there are a lot of things. We have a trifecta right now, the DFL, because people, we're not, you know, we're honest with people about what we want to do, right? We want to fund programs. We want to help childcare. We want to help uh, have more housing. We want to have more youth and family services. Uh, we've told all these people this. They understand it costs money, and they voted us into office. Um, and so I think we're being true to who we are, who Minnesota is, in having these kind of bills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Kosnick. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, madam. <laughs> yep, again? He said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I would never. I, I'm trying to Cosmic. kill some time for my good friend, Representative Hornstein. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't beat up on his bill too much. Um, oh, he's I, ready. He's ready. He I wants know, to yeah. talk about tax havens and all these things. <laughs> and um, I, I appreciate that the previous um, committee member speaking uh, mentioned the fourth tier because that was uh, one of the things that I... I uh, forgot to mention in my previous comments, Chair Davids, um, but the 
the fourth tier was added in enacted in 2013 and so we got one member's opinion on that uh, i wonder if the author has uh some additional comments on that but uh i think it goes to show that either uh the fourth tier uh it was said that it's good stuff but apparently it's not good enough because now we're adding more taxes in a, in a fifth tier um but I, I think the general conversation isn't even um adding a fifth tier it's just that we're adding more taxes in this bill, but also across the board, um, one of the other um, committee members, you know, said uh, a booms a booms day tax everybody bill. Th that's not what this is. You're right; it's not taxing everybody. But this is a session where the Democrats are taxing everybody on everything, um, and it just goes back to that. There isn't. There isn't a point in time, I don't think, that we would get to create enough tax revenue for Democrats to spend. And that's what I think the problem is here and where the disconnect is, is where there's a point where we need to say government can only do so much. And to continue to ask families uh, to continue to pay more um, is, is a problem because I think it robs families and individuals of achieving their best, highest potential and providing for themselves and their own independence and freedoms. And so I wonder if the author um, has any additional comments on why the fourth, adding the fourth highest tax bracket, the fourth tier, wasn't uh, good enough in 2013. And the point was also made that there was, you know, honesty in, in um, the elections where we've yet to see the elimination of social security income tax that so many across the state on both sides of the aisle ran across but now we get into the tax committee and we've seen big opposition uh, and uh, recanting on that from the governor's office all the way down to members of the tax committee uh, of the democrats that say no we're not going to eliminate the social security income tax completely so um, if the author has some comments on why we why the fourth tier wasn't successful enough and why that's not good enough. Um, I'd be curious because I, I, I think it was. Representative Herr. Uh, Chair Gomez, Representative Kosnick. Boy, I, I don't even know where to begin with that question because uh, I, I don't think there's an assumption that the fourth tier wasn't good enough. I think that maybe is your own interpretation of what has been said. I think that the fourth tier did just fine and I think that the point is is that everyone thought the sky was going to fall with the fourth tier and it didn't and Minnesota continues to grow, and Minnesota continues to do well. Minnesota continues to attract businesses and people here. And so I, I, so I guess I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because I don't believe in the same premise that you're laying out. And so that's all I can say is that the fourth tier, I don't think that it didn't work. I think that, you know, it's like everything in our own lives, right? Because I improve my life in a way where I say, oh, I'm done. Like when I stopped being poor and a refugee that couldn't barely, like, you know, didn't know where food was coming the next day and I got my college education, I didn't think, Oh, I did it. It's good enough. No, because there, because we continue to try to do better by people. We continue to try to do better by ourselves, and so then we continue to look at how we improve policies and the work that we do, so that we can continue to improve people's lives. So I don't even think we're operating the same premise of the question that you're asking. So I don't know how to answer that question for you, except for that we will continue to do better as Minnesotans, and I will bet on Minnesotans every day to continue to make those improvements. Uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I think um, I'll ground us back into the bill we're talking about in front of us, and I want to thank Representative Herr for bringing this forward. Just as a reminder, this is adding another tax bracket just by one more percent over the, for those making over a million dollars jointly, $600,000 singly. And I know it may seem odd at this time to be doing this, but I think Minnesotans are very smart, and I think they understand that what we have right now on the surplus is one-time money. And it's not one-time money just from this year. It's one-time money from last year and one-time money from the year before that has been sitting there because we didn't take action this last year. And Minnesotans also, and this is what I absolutely love about our state, is we take care of each other. And we know that it costs money to do that. And we also know that the stability of our state for our economy moving forward is what helps us grow. We, um, for decades, were those job creators. We funded higher ed 
So we had the Medtronics and the 3Ms show up. And then gradually we kind of lost focus. We, we lost focus in our North Star of taking care of each other and investing in things that mattered. And over the years, the cost of government has actually declined. And some people might think that's great, and maybe it is. The problem is with that came underinvestment. And when we start underinvesting in our future is when we really start getting into problems. As a reminder, 40% of our state budget is our education system. Our businesses, one of the key indicators they come for is not just for our economy, but for an educated workforce. I know they're not coming here because of the weather, and they sure as heck aren't coming here because of our transportation system right now, which is another area that we have drastically underfunded over the last 30 years. The only time we had a gas tax increase was when we had a bridge fall down. That's shameful. And I, I just want to thank Representative Her. I don't really even have a question for you. It just means so much to me to know that we're having this discussion about how Minnesotans take care of each other and having that paradigm shift of instead of going from one budget to the next and saying, hey, what can I get for this money? It's like, it's like a teenager hopped up on crack at a flea market, like I have this $2 to spend, let's figure out what we can do with it versus <laughs> I'm going somewhere because yeah. I want to spend this money. I want to invest in people. <laughs> this is the policy direction we want to go because we know it's important. We know it's important to take care of our veterans. We know it's important to take care of our seniors in nursing homes. We know it's important to put roofs over people's head, to invest in our education system. And we are willing to figure out what it's gonna take to do that. Instead of just saying, oh, you know what? This is all I have to spend. Let's, let's figure out what, what we can get with that. So thank you, Representative Her, for thinking about the stability and the structural stability of Minnesota going forward so we can do these good things and continue to grow our own economy and make sure that Minnesotans are taken care of and want to stay here. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Joy. Real quick, Madam Chair, I know yep. this is my second time. Yep. Um, one of the things I heard, you know, uh, Representative Olson over there said that, you know, when, we, when we've asked to do different things, fund nursing homes, fund more of these things, and we, we need tax money to do that. We can't just continue to fund things and not have the revenue. You know, when you look at that and you look at, we gave nursing homes $4 million, we can't get rid of Social Security tax, but yet we're okay doing paid family. You know, those are things we got to look at too. Maybe we don't have to move forward with paid family right now and we could use that money to reduce Social Security tax or we could do something different for nursing home. So those are some smart things I think we got to do in the tax committee too is also look at how we can fund the right move and not always have to add onto the tax basis. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Davids. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And um, could Mr. Uh, Baglio come down for a question? Uh, Mr. Bolio. Or what's the name? I think I said it right. Yeah, no, it's close. Baglio? <laughs> okay, we both said it wrong, but if you could just state your name for the record, please, as you go ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, Madam Chair, members. My name is Ben Balio. I've been Balio. called by words okay. before. Oh, we Why close. is the G in there? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Out of order. Please don't badger the witness. Okay. Representative <laughs> Davids. <laughs> okay, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll lay off. <laughs> I'll lay off. Um, I was so excited uh, during your testimony. First of all, I think that we have several disconnects here because I thought we were talking about Representative Her's bill, and it's not her fault we weren't. we were disconnected because her bill does what it does. But then we're saying we're going to put more money in child care. Well, doesn't that go like the education committee or something? We're going to put more money for nursing. Doesn't that kind of go like to, we weren't talking about the bill. We were disconnected, no fault of the author, of course. But my, I just got so excited. You said, and I quote, the rich should pay their fair share. Oh. Oh, here we what go. is that number? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Gomez. Uh, Mr. Balio. Representative I Davids. Uh, I'm not actually uh, a tax policy expert, so I'm not entirely sure what arbitrary number I'd be able to come up with in this hearing on that. But, um, you know, I think this bill is creating that fifth tier uh, in order to make sure that those who are the highest earners in our state are paying their fair share, which I think when we look at the needs of our state, you know, typically means uh, if you're making more, you're benefiting more, you're probably paying more. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank Representative you. Thank you, Representative Davids. Uh, now I'm totally depressed. 
Um, I thought I was going to get that number. We whipped that phrase around like it, you, people know what they're talking about, and they don't. So it, when you said that, you didn't have a number. You didn't have a number for us. I want a number. I hear it. If I hear in this committee one more time that somebody has to pay their fair share, I want the number. And I will always ask for that because you made a statement and you didn't have a number for it. So I, I, I really caution folks to do that. Pay their fair share. What does that mean? It's meaningless uh, unless I get a number here at some point. So on the IRS building in Washington, D.C., there's a phrase up. Uh, you can go now. You can. Um, there's a. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I'm used to being chair. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I apologize. We, uh, Representative Davids, this is okay, but like, if a member says something that you want to interrogate, that's fine. But our members of the public, like, we, I, I just want us to not be like splitting their uh, sort of choice of words apart. So let's. Well, just, Madam Chair, if anybody yeah. in this committee says anything, it's open for question. Sir, doesn't have to remember. The public is going to be open for question too if they say something like that. Repres yeah, Representative okay. David. At the top of the IRS building, the entrance it says taxes are what we pay for civilized society. With this bill, I think we are the most civilized society in the United States of America. Um, and just a couple points to make here. We're talking about more people coming in than leaving. Well, you might want to subscribe to a service called How Many Walks? How Many Walks? There's a lot more money leaving the state than coming in, and there are more people leaving than coming in. But if you look at the incomes of those leaving versus the incomes of those coming in, uh, there, there's really, really quite a disconnect. And I'd like to correct my good friend, Representative Kosnick, for the record here in taxing, because we must be accurate. He made the comment, government or the governor down to the tax committee. The correct statement would have been tax committee way down to the governor. So we, we just have to make sure how that how that's phrased there. So one good thing that's come out of this session so far is we're giving my billionaire friends, and I have many of them, uh, my billionaire friends' kids of free meals at school. So that's, you know, it's not all bad here. So, um, and, and this, this bill from Representative Her is not in, well, we're hearing it today in a vacuum, but it's not in a vacuum. We have many, many bills that we've heard so far. And Chair Gomez, you got quite a job to do for next week to present a tax bill to us with all the needs and with the numbers that you have. I, when I first heard some of the numbers, I thought it was like trying to suck a watermelon through a garden hose. It's going to be tough. It's going to be very tough. And so I'm very interested to see uh, what, what comes out uh, next, next week. So uh, like I said, we're kind of disconnected. And my good friend uh, Chair Olson of the Ways and Means Committee was saying that you folks on that other side of the aisle, you want all these things, you want Social Security tax relief. When uh, Representative Smith said that we're being honest, no, we're not. Everybody ran on getting rid of Social Security tax. Or not everybody, not everybody. A majority. No. Nope. Yes. <laughs> In the Senate. Yeah. Well, we'll I'll, I'll do my numbers for you. So, but to say that because we want Social Security tax relief and we want rebate checks and we want these things, we could pay for them. I went home over this, this hallowed uh, holy last week, Easter. I went home, and the people are saying, well, when do we get those, so, you know, Social Security eliminated? When do we get the rebate checks? When do we get it? I said, well, you're not going to get it. Plus, you're going to spend $10 billion more. And they were stunned. They were stunned that that's what's going to happen this session. $17.6 billion surplus. Plus, we're going to blow through that with no relief to anybody, and then we're going to spend another $10 billion. It's just amazing. It's just amazing to me. So, uh, members, uh, I think there's some good advice given a little bit earlier. We need to slow down on some of this stuff because tax policy does make a difference. It does make a difference. And in the tax world, as a rule, if you go dynamically, more is less and less is more. The more you tax, the less you get. The less you tax, the more you get. And that works. It worked in 2011 when we had $6.2 billion uh, deficit. What did we do? What did I do? I lowered taxes. And two years later, in June, we were even. It works. This is not the only bad thing going on here, but it's, it's, it's something uh, that has really headed us uh, down the wrong direction. So um, thank you for your time. And uh, my billionaire friends are just uh, ecstatic that they get free lunches for their kids. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Her, closing comments. Thank you, Chair Gomez, and thank you, committee, for a robust discussion. Um, 
I just wanted to address a couple of things because I did sit here and I did take a lot of notes um, from everyone and I know I don't, I'm cutting into Chair Hornstein's time, but I feel like it's important to address. So first I want to say that I reject the analogy that of Minnesota, like a sinking ship, like the Titanic. I reject that notion completely because Minnesota is not a sinking ship. Um, I will bet on Minnesota any day because Minnesota wants to do right by each other. And so, um, you know, I, I think that that, in, that comparison actually creates um, a situation in which it looks like we are going in the wrong direction, but Minnesota has actually been going in the right direction. So I was in the private sector for 15 years, and I've lived in many states doing my private sector job. I came from Wisconsin, and yes, when I came from Wisconsin as a, a fresh college student, yeah, I was one of those low-income people that came in, and maybe somebody really high income left, and look at I filled their spot, and now I have first world problems, right? Like <laughs> my husband works at an, you know, is an invest, does an institutional investment at a bank, and he's worked with some of the most prestigious firms, and like. Like we stopped paying taxes, some of the taxes by September. He can't contribute anymore to his 401k panel because he exceeds the actual dollar limit. Like these are first world problems, right? Like, and we're not even in this tax bracket that we're trying, this fifth tier, we're not even there. And so when we're worried about those individuals who are, you know, gosh, they're, we should be worried about them because they make tax above a million dollars. Like I'm not worried about those individuals. I, and like, pe like the state of Minnesota invested in me. And when we're talking about, we need to have investments in people to be here. There was a comment about how we attract talent. This is it, like I was that talent you attracted. And I lived in many states afterwards. I came to Minnesota, I worked out in Washington DC. I lived in Chicago and you know where I came back to? Minnesota because this is where I wanted to raise my family. This is because we have good education system here, because we do have great public services here. I came back to Minnesota, I could have lived anywhere, I could have lived in any other state, and I chose to be back here in Minnesota. So the things that we are trying to warn people of, this is actually the place to be. And so, one, we are not a sinking ship, and I reject that notion at all in that comparison. Two, we are actually, this is the investment in the state that we need to bring in new talent, new ideas to fill that workforce. Are the people leaving, not because our taxes are so high, because Arizona and Florida, when you're older, much better place to be than 30 below here in February. But you are getting new people who we are investing in so that they can pay the taxes I'm paying right now. And you all know what we make here. It's not because I'm making so much money. You know, it's like the investment made in our family is what is paying the taxes so that everyone else can have the services that they need. And so I just wanted to make sure that we, we really understand what we're doing here. And you're right. This is not a single bill. In totality, all of the things that we're trying to do makes Minnesota better. Because when I'm looking at my pension bill, I'm not just looking at pensions. I'm looking at, well, how else did we invest in people who have pensions with us? Did, you know, are we investing in younger teachers who are uh, getting the services they need in school so that their EL students uh, have a fully funded education? And thank you, Chair Yuakim, for putting that into the bill. Like We're looking at all ways in which all we do intersect, because none of us work on our problems in a silo. When you have a problem in your life, you don't say, well, I can't work in the other 10 problems because I'm only focusing on one thing. We are complex people in Minnesota and we can focus on many, many things. Having uh, family leave for people who need it, making sure that childcare is funded, making sure that those who are, who are at the top income level can pay more. And you know, the, the truth is, is that the term fair share, there isn't good, I didn't use that term and I don't actually like that term because it is really difficult. But we have to acknowledge that there is a segment of our population that says, I don't feel like the system is fair. They're not saying, let me give you a number to make it fair. They're saying, I am not feeling the justice in this system, in the money that I make. And so I want it to be fair. And that's all that they can say for us to punish them for using words that they know because they're not sitting in finances and taxes doing the numbers with us. It's really unfair for us to, to attack them in that way. And I will just say that you're right. I don't, I'm not necessarily for taxing tobacco, but you know what, what taxing tobacco did? We reduced the number of uh, young people who smoke. We uh, reduced lung cancer. We actually improved the health of, our, of individuals within our society. And I'm sorry, but that's a society I want to be a part of. So you know what? Taxes may not be the best, but it actually has great benefits too. And so we can look at the pros and cons of all, but let's just look at what is the society in which we want to build here in Minnesota. So with that, I do ask for all of your support in this bill. It is a great way for us to really look at those who can pay to be able to provide uh, that uh, additional uh, income for us. So thank you, committee. We have another bill. Thank you, Representative Herr. All right, uh, with that, I am going to renew my motion that House File 442, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And, 44 to, um, and House File 40, 40, 442, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Thank you. <laughs>